to get saved for salvation, for a life change, then you have to realize there's a day coming that you're not going to be excited about if this day finds you not saved. Because we know that Jesus Christ, our Savior, is coming back for his church. Look with me, if you would, please, verse 22, Luke chapter 17. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here or see there. He said, Go not after them nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must be, watch this, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And that has already taken place. And then he says, as it were in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came, and look at these last words, and destroyed them all. Likewise also it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven. Here's our statement again. And the Lord destroyed them all. Father in heaven, help us today as we look into the blessed word of God. Would you prepare our hearts to receive the scriptures? Help us to understand there's a day coming, which it could be today, that you will split the eastern sky and call out your bride. Father in heaven, we get homesick thinking about the things that has awaited us, not only our family that's went on before, but all the wondrous joys to be with you and to be in a place called heaven. But as the scripture bears out, not all will go. There will be some will make excuses one or another, to the degree that they think they have plenty of time. And they know not that one day, like lightning, you will come and catch out your bride. Thank you for the privilege of warning us. Thank you for allowing us to be prepared, to be ready, and to always looking unto that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us today to honor you with all that's within us. Bless now this time together, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you for your standing. Wow, the second coming. As a lot of people will... That's the cordials of time, the beginning of the church... Jesus is coming, and he still has not come. But I want to tell you that he's one day closer today than he was yesterday. And whether people don't acknowledge it, it hasn't stopped him from fulfilling his promise. He said, if I go, I will come again. That again is what I am looking for, that we might go home and be with the Lord. In the scripture we just read, it's a... Pretty well a good graphic description about what was going on in Noah's day and also in Lot's day. The activities that are described were not just sinful activities. They were indicating about a culture that were going through the world. And the main thought is they wasn't giving much thought to God. Or maybe even the consequences of one's activities. Jesus is teaching us that in the last days will resemble the same days it was prior to the flood. He lets us know that these things happen unto them for an example. Judgment came and no one was left but Noah, his wives, 
his three sons and their wives. It was a hard thing to believe that when they got off the ark, they looked around and there was no one upon the earth. The flood, as God had said, had taken them all away. Judgment had came. Now, I know it might rain a lot, but God's promised us we would not go by a flood. And we have a rainbow at usually at the end of every rain that tells of the covenant God has made with Noah. I want to share today about four elements that lets us know that we're in the last days. I understand Noah preached for 120 years. And as a preacher of righteousness, it's hard to accept that when you proclaim the truth and there's no converts. I preached my heart out for 120 years and nobody believed. Nobody repented. Nobody got on the ark. Well, as gospel preachers, we like to see the work of God's hands. We love to proclaim the truth, whether it's in the jail or on the street corner or in the churches. We like to see the movement of God, the Holy Spirit, and convicting sin and drawing people to the wonderful Savior of the world. We don't always get to see it. Because there's people that have come in and out of our services over the years, got under conviction, but for whatever reason, whether it was embarrassment, well, you know, one preacher told me, uh, I went forward in a revival, but it took me like four days of the revival because I was embarrassed to let the people know that I was lost. Preachers are not supposed to be lost people. And he said, and do you know what a battle I had? But finally, when the conviction got so bad, I said, I don't care what they think. I'm going to get my heart. Now, he could have done it in his pew. No one would have been the wiser. But he said, I want folks to know that if you're not saved, it don't matter if the whole world don't like it, you need to get born into the family of God. And I, I remember that when we were in the old church, how God had spoken to Brother Huey Shelton, and I mean broke his heart, and I thought, and he was my Sunday school teacher, but he, listen, he wept his way to Calvary. And listen, folks, been running to God for 2,000 years, and I hope they're not tired nor embarrassed. I hope they're brokenhearted and they're concerned about their condition. Let's look at a couple of thoughts this morning. Number one, we can know that we're close to the last days because of an acceleration of sinfulness. It's getting pretty bad. But wait a minute, we're not done. The Bible tells us it's going to wax worse and worse in the last days. Listen what Genesis chapter 4, since our scripture text reminded us back of Noah, listen what Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 said. There were giants in the, in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, were of old, men of renown. Let me give you a quick thought. In Genesis chapter 6, we found this judgment was coming because there was a lack of spiritual separation. Nobody wanted to be different. Look, the most spiritual group we had was Noah, his wives and his sons and their wives. That was the church so to speak, eight people in however many people we had upon the earth. And verse 5 of that same chapter said, And God saw the wickedness of man was great upon the earth. And I want to stop reading and say, what does he think now when he looks? Would he ever say, I should apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for destroying them, and maybe even Noah's day for destroying them, but wait a minute. God is a holy God. And the Bible said, he, this is what he's seen. He's seen that every imagination of their thoughts, listen, watch this, in his heart was evil continually. It almost sounds like reading the Decatur Daily. And then we've seen a lack of moral standards. They just didn't hold themselves very high in the regards of believing in God, serving God versus what they did today to feel good and to make them uh, pleasing to themselves. 
We also find in Luke chapter 17 in our scripture reading, verses 26 and verse 27, let me back up and read these two verses. Watch this in your hearing. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. As it was in the days of Noah. Nothing changed. They were going about their merry business and deciding in their facts that they were going to do what we want to do. It almost sounds like our news today. Mankind is going their merry way, but they're going away from the straight and narrow pathway. I hope and pray that the church has not lost the light of the focus on living for God. People ought to see us and they ought to feel uncomfortable. You're so spiritual, you make me feel uncomfortable. I remember when I worked with a man that was a godly Christian, he kept inviting me to church, and he always had such a wonderful disposition. I remember his last name, and this is back in the early 70s. His name was Shanny Fount. He was a godly man. I'm not sure now if he pastored a church, but he invited me to church day after day after day. Brother Ivan, I thought, man, I just wish you would get off of this going to church thing and stop inviting me. I'm not coming. He said, you'll never know what a day may bring forth. So I thought, well, one thing I can understand, you're the happiest one man I've ever seen in my life. He was always laughing. He was always rejoicing. He always carried a pocket New Testament. There was something that told me about church, about God. He had a belief in himself that he understood God was so important to him that God was his uh, literal standard for living in this world. So whether I was acknowledging it, I seen God, I seen the church, and I seen the gospel presentation because I realized when we put our lunches at places, he would have a gospel track under my lunch. Trying to reach me, trying to tell me, and I wish he's probably no doubt gone off the scene. I was in my early 20s, and he was probably maybe in his 60s. But I would like to tell him, listen, that wasn't for nothing. It did get to working in me. It probably took about almost 10 years before it to take but I remember I never could forget about you, and I did like a lot of people do with Christians. I started avoiding him because I knew wherever he worked, he wasn't going to just say, how's your day? It's a good day to work. He'd say, hey, did I, let me tell you what happened at church. I don't want to hear what happened at church. I want to hear what's going on in the party scene. He said, well, son, I party. Not like I party, but he had a love for God that just radiated over his wonderful face. The Bible said they did eat, they drank, they married wives. Well, I'm glad that they felt comfortable enough to find them a spouse so that they could find something that would make them happy. But listen, today mankind is blinded by the effects that light would give them light. This light that Satan has given them has darkened their minds. Satan is responsible for a portion of the blindness. And I'm going to give you a verse of Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Now listen, And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Now watch. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So therefore, Satan is responsible partly but man is also re partly responsible because he desires not to know the truth. Man has always had a choice. You remember in Joshua 24 where he said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. So mankind has the wonderful privilege of making a good, solid choice about not only where you will eat, who you will marry, and where you will go to church, but also if you want to serve God or not you, have the freedom to choose. Number one is because the acceleration of sinfulness and it's going to get worse. Number two, because of an approaching storm. In Genesis chapter six, verse number seven, listen what this says. And the Lord said, 
I will destroy man whom I have created from off the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and the fowls of the air. He said, for it repenteth me that I have made man. Can you imagine this morning that God said, I've had it up to here. I don't want mankind on the earth anymore. I have, I mean literally. Now we're talking about somebody who's patient. But God said, my patience has run out. I am going to destroy all mankind. Wow. The Bible tells us that he destroyed mankind from off the earth. But wait a minute. A flood's coming in our day and... Noah and the rest of the inhabitants wasn't ready other than Noah and his family. But mankind heard the words of the coming judgment. But how many said, I'm going to get on just in case that old crazy preacher is right. Well, I don't ever remember Noah ever throwing anybody off the boat. They didn't believe it then and they're not believing it today. They really don't believe that there's going to come a day when Jesus Christ is going to come and the church will be gone. The buildings are not going anywhere, but we, the body of Christ, is going home to be with our Lord. And if not that, what about what will happen if you miss the rapture? What about the tribulation? What about the great tribulation? If you've done any reading and studying in the book of Revelations, as most people say, I'm terrified to read the book of Revelations. It has nothing to do with the church. This has to do with those who are left behind. That means they never were born again. Now listen, they never cr trusted Christ as their Savior. They didn't repent of their sins and invite Him into their heart for forgiveness. So therefore, many became religious, many joined churches, and many were baptized, but all they got in the baptistry was wet. Still in their sins, and at the end of days when the rapture takes place, or through death, they realize they didn't wake up in heaven. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44 says this, Therefore be ye ready. Why? Because you don't know. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. He is coming. The world is headed toward another judgment and it don't realize the magnitude nor the force of the storm. It's hard to paint you a picture here this morning of what hell would be like. I've heard people who had near-death experiences in the emergency rooms or in car wrecks and many of them have said a lot of strange things and doctors say, well, they were just in trauma. It wasn't real. Try telling them that. That what they thought, that what they felt, what they seen was not real. It was a trauma to the brain. Listen, if you get burned today on your finger from an iron or you get caught in a fire, it's not an imagination. It's not just a trauma. It's a real occurrence. One thing that I don't like in this life is fire. You get a little bird and it seems to take weeks for that thing to recover. So I definitely do not want to go to the place that's called the eternal lake of fire. Not only is there a storm coming, the Bible says in number three is a, an active savior. God was doing something in Noah's day and in Lot's day. Well, I want to tell you today, God's doing something in our day. He's gathering his church together He's getting them ready. He is teaching them and training them how to walk in the light as he is in the light that people will see Christ in us. And in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. God was busy in Noah's day. He was observing and categorizing the activity and the conditions of the world he still sees everything that happens from the beginning to the end. And he's looking at our world today, again, paying attention, understanding where it's going, the decisions that mankind makes, and the decisions that we make are detrimental. It's either going to help us 
or it's going to completely get our hearts on the wrong direction and the wrong place. God was disturbed by what he saw. I can't imagine a family or two, but the whole earth, the whole earth was full of sin, and God said, I would to God I'd have never made them. Now, when God is repenting of something he's done, church, it's got to be pretty bad. As I know that he looks over the world today, what is his thoughts? What is his decision? Has he gotten close again to the place where I've just about had all I can take? You see, God was working in Noah's day, and we must remember God is working in our day. We might not see revivals flushing the land. We not, might not be able to hear people are being saved by the thousands, but God's still working. His bride is not complete. He's still saving those to the uttermost. He's still sobering up drunks and getting drug addicts uh, uh, straight and on the narrow pathway. He's getting people to stand on a solid rock. He's getting people to believe in what they know, which is Christ. So we can understand today that our Savior is so active. And if you don't believe that, think about all the people that's been healed of their sicknesses, their cancers, their problems, miraculous cures. Or they say, well, it's not really miracle in our day and time. As far as I'm concerned, if God has a hand in it, it's a miracle. It's a miracle we're still here today, and we're in good health. And lastly, this morning, God in that day had a spokesman, and God in our day still has a spokesman. It's me, it's you, it's our church. Noah was God's mouthpiece in that day. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 3 and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also his flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Brother Boyd, if you could, could you turn me down just a tad? He said his days will be a hundred and twenty years. He preached of the coming judgment, literally for a hundred and twenty years, warning people, judgment is coming, there's going to be a rain, it's going to come until it covers the entire earth, over 22 feet over the highest peaks. Yet he preached on. He didn't see anybody believe. He didn't have anybody to come help him to build his ark. He could have literally destroyed the world instantly. God could have done that. He could have magically spoke the word of an ark and it would have been there for Noah and his family. But he said, no, they need time. They need to hear. They need to be warned. Can you imagine, 120 years, seven days a week, he was working, he was telling people, there's a reason why I'm doing this, God's going to destroy the world. They didn't believe then, it's like they don't believe today. Now, who is God's spokesman today? Who is telling people, there's a day coming, and I want you to understand, you're not going to live forever. This old body is going to wear out, and we do understand what it's like to wear out. And it's, I mean, basically, if it works, it hurts. If it don't work, it's because it, it just don't work anymore. But God has helped us to prepare ourselves ready for that coming day. And now, Brother Boyd, I can honestly say with my heart, even so, come Lord Jesus. Uh, things are ready. I'm ready. Is the world ready? No, they wasn't ready in Noah's day either. And they weren't ready in Lot's day. Lot went in there and lived for years trying to convince those people that he was a righteous man. He left and he couldn't even convince his own family. He left. All he had was his two daughters and his wife. The instructions the angel gave Lot was flee the city and don't look back. A lot of people jumped on Miss Lot. Because they thought, how could you? Look what it left you. But it gives me the impression that she had grandchildren. She had family. And she was thinking when she heard fire and brimstone come firing down from heaven, she looked back to see, was there any of my family come running behind me? And when she looked, the Bible says she turned into a pillar of salt, which is there unto this day. She got out of the city. She got away from the judgment of God of fire and brimstone. 
but she did the one thing she was told not to do. Run, go out of the city, and don't look back. Sometimes they think God is so harsh. He, he gives us such strange, strange instructions. Some things doesn't really matter as long as I keep running and I look back. But God told her, don't look back. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. He said, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Our duty before the Lord today is to warn people, cry loud, and tell them Jesus is coming. We're not going to be destroyed by water, but Jesus Christ is coming. The church will be raptured out or snatched away, whatever your theology wants, and we will forever be with the Lord. Now, one young lady told me, she said, you know, my pastor told me that I can be saved in the tribulation period. And I said, it would be to your best advantage not to wait. Because in 2 Thessalonians tells us that God said he would send them a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. Amen. So whatever the Antichrist paints a picture that he's God, there's going to be a many people that are going to believe it and they're going to be damned according to the scripture. Our duty our desire, our direction is to tell people why time is running out. Do we have 120 years like Noah? I haven't a clue. I know that God said he's long-suffering. He was long-suffering in Noah's day. He was long-suffering in Lot's day. And today with America and all of our wonderful countries that make up our world, he's long-suffering. Sometimes he has to be long-suffering to put up with, Lord, it's me again. I'm sorry I made a mistake. I'm, I'm sorry I repent. Listen, you can agree with me today that we're in the last days. This is it. I wish I could say we're, and I've heard some preachers that said we're absolutely ready on the threshold of worldwide revival. I wished it were so. Because then I'd know that everybody I know has an opportunity to be saved. But the Bible tells us that in the last days, things are going to wax worse and worse. And it gives a long list of the things that are going to happen. Look around. Do you think there's anybody that needs help? Is there anybody that needs to hear a salvation message? I'm thankful that I'm saved. That's just me and one person. But I will never have to face God's tribulation, His judgment, and I'll never have to wake up in hell. But there's a lost world all around me and you that needs to be told, they need to be warned, they need to be prayed for, they need to be pleaded with, time is not on your side. The other day I gave a lady a gospel tract, she looked at it and like, can you imagine if the rapture took place, she'd have said, where, where was that gospel tract? Where did that tell me how to be saved? Where did that tell me who to trust? What did I do with that? It's too late. Time is ending. Church, I want to tell you something. My stepdad said somebody gave him a gospel tract right after he got out of the Air Force. And he said, I took it and threw it in my desk drawer. And he said, I worked with this company for 26 years. And he said, and when they were laying off, I was cleaning out my desk, getting rid of all my stuff, and at the back of my desk, there was this gospel tract. He said, I was throwing all this stuff in the waste paper basket, but when I got to that, I stopped, I looked at it, I read it, I got under Holy Ghost conviction, he said right at his desk, he bowed his head and said, God, I don't know how long that that's been in here, but if you will still give me an opportunity, if you'll still save me. And he said, he said, Donald, I want to tell you, I trusted Christ. 26 years, that track was sitting in my desk. He said, and I thought about how many times I could have died, how many opportunities I had, and it was right there in my desk. And he said, and I don't remember anybody inviting me to church or telling me about Jesus, but then there was this track 
just one gospel presentation. And he said, and we've seen a slew of people saved since I got saved. Folks, I want to tell you something. There's dark days ahead. There's thunderstorms that will come. They will burden our lives, break our hearts, cause us to weep and cry for the things that will be all around us. But one glorious day, the sun will shine. Jesus will come and we'll go. Wow, and we'll go. Let's stand with our feet, uh, to our feet with our heads bowed, if you would, please. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus said, harden not your heart. Oh, that God would prepare our hearts to be missionaries everywhere. Mankind needs a Savior. Oh, our God, do we have a burden? Do we have a concern? Do we have a care? Are we saying, thank God for me and mine and no more? Or do we say, Lord, what about the others? What about the multitude? We might not be able to invite them all to church, but we can leave them with a gospel track that says you must be born again. You must trust Christ as your Savior. You must repent of your sins. So, dear God, in these last days, would you please, in Jesus' name, help us to have a brokenness, a burden, and a heavy heart that everyone we look at, we look at potential people coming to Christ. What if they don't know? Somebody one day invited me way back when. I wasn't interested. I wasn't concerned. But thank God somebody tried again and again and again. And I finally had the wonderful opportunity coming to church to hear the blessed gospel. And I trusted you as my Lord and Savior. Would you please help us today to reach out far and wide to send them in a letter to send them in a posted return envelope. There's some way we can get the gospel out all over our fair land. Father, would you please forgive us for letting down the bloodstained banner? Would you forgive us, oh God, for not literally firing the trails with uh, burdens and tears and uh, praying for the lost? Oh God, would you help us to reach them before it's too late? Father, I pray in Jesus' name today that those that are listening, those that are desirous to know, can God help me? Can God forgive somebody of my caliber? We want them to know that God forgives your sin. God will write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life if you'll just ask God for mercy and grace. Tell him it's not you, it's him. And oh God, I pray that in this day that people will still run to Jesus while there's time. Please, Holy Spirit of God, lead us by your Spirit. Help us to be caring and concerned about a lost and dying world. Oh, dear God, we'll stand before the multitudes one day, and I wonder how many will point their fingers at us and say, you knew and you said nothing. You knew my, what would be my end, and you said nothing. Oh, that God would have mercy and forgive us. Lead us now in this invitation by your precious Holy Spirit. Please forgive us where we've fallen, where we fell short. Our God, please teach us by your holy and perfect will. Bless now this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.